Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to Mark chapter 1, Mark's gospel, the first chapter. We're talking about love this morning. You know, one thing that I've learned in being in ministry over 30 years, that one of the most important lessons that all of us can learn is how to love people. And you know, so many times I get people that they want to call themselves mature Christians, but they don't know how to walk in love. And they say, Pastor, I'm, I'm not getting fed. I want to get into the deep things and the meat of the Word of God. And, you know, I find out that there's just a real lack of maturity there. We were studying 1 Corinthians on Wednesday night, and we got into some really deep things as far as meat goes. But one of the things that Paul wrote about was he said, I want to go on and feed you meat, but I have to feed you with milk because you're babies, you're carnal, you're, you're, you're still worldly. And he says, the reason is because you can't get along with each other. There's, there's not unity in the church. And so this is an extremely important message to me because when there's love in the church and it's dominating the church and, and there's unity among God's people, God will show up in powerful ways. But the Bible says where there's strife and division, there's every evil work, right? And so if you want the presence and the power of God in your life and in your church, We've got to learn how to get along with each other. I mean, really, as Christian believers, we're spending eternity together, aren't we? <laughs> so we need to learn how to get along together now in this lifetime. And so we're talking about the reckless love of God. And God just put on my heart many different examples of Jesus loving people that he wasn't supposed to love, touching people he wasn't supposed to touch, reaching out to people that society and culture said those aren't people that, that are acceptable, that are normal, that are, are the type of people that you want to reach out to. And so let's look at this story here in Mark's Gospel, the first chapter. In the 40th verse, it says, A leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken... Immediately, the leprosy left the man, and he was cleansed. Now, you have to understand, in the culture of the, day, of the days of Jesus, I was studying leprosy. I looked it up on the Internet. It's something that, that uh, is very controllable today, that it, it's not contagious, that, that they can, uh, there's, there's a cure for it. it. For the most part, there's uh, some one type that, that's not necessarily. But in, in their day and in their culture, they believed it to be very contagious. They believed it to be a curse of God upon somebody. And so if God cursed that person, you were not supposed to touch them. You were not supposed to associate them. They felt like you would catch the leprosy, that the curse would come upon you. And so many of the lepers were not allowed in the city. They were left outside the city gate to beg. They were not allowed to have a job. They were not allowed to be around their family. If you could imagine that, they were outcasts. And so here is this, this leper coming up to Jesus, asking for healing. And last week, we defined reckless love or reckless as something without caution or care of consequence. And we see this in this story here, that Jesus goes up to this man without caution, without care about catching the disease, without care about what society and culture would say. Because really, if he touched this man, they could have kept Jesus out of the city. They could have kept Jesus from being around people. And so when it comes to love, I believe that actions speak far louder than words. Amen? There's that old saying that, that, that uh, 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 actions are, are worth a thousand words, right? I know I just screwed that up, but I can't remember exactly how it goes. But um, we are talking about the application of love in light of, of reaching this current generation that we live in. We talked last week about Generation Z and those that are 20 years of age and under and some of the challenges of reaching out to them. Do you know that that generation right now comprises 25% of the population of our world? 25%. That's, that's quite a lot of power in our world, quite a lot of power in our culture. New statistics came out last summer that said the average attention span of somebody of, of that generation is about 8.25 seconds. That's almost a full second less than the attention span of a goldfish. And can you imagine that? And so we live in a generation that is very visual. You know, one of the things that you'll see 
on televisions, and I, I come from a different culture. I hate commercials, right? I, I, I'll watch three different programs at a time so I don't have to watch commercials. I'll go back and forth, and I just hate the, 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 the materialistic mentality of our culture. And uh, you'll see commercials more and more and more, you know? They, not just commercials, but now during the, the television show, something pops into the bottom of the screen. They're advertising subtly. You ever try to watch the news show? You know, the broadcaster's getting lost because they got stuff across the front, top of the screen, stuff running on the bottom, little thing in the corner, little thing here. You know, they're trying to take those people that have such small attention spans and throw so much at them at once. Why? Because we live in a very visual culture. And I want you to understand this morning that reckless love if we're going to reach this generation, must be visual. Amen? It must be more than just mere words. Amen? That's one of my favorite scenes in, in the, uh, the movie, The Patriot. And that's a video clip we should have had this morning. We've been trying to find a good video clip for our message today. But uh, they're, they're talking about the battle and fighting against the enemy. And, and, and the, the young girl stands up. They're trying to recruit soldiers. And she says, you guys have talked about your, your devotion, your patriotism. And all. When it comes to, to action, will you stop at mere words? I love that quote. And I tell you, when it comes to Christ and his love, will we stop at mere words? Or will we act this love? Will we act on this love? Will we act on this commandment of God to, to love each other? In Romans chapter 5, in verse 8, it says God demonstrates his love towards us. That's not just verbal. That's visual. It's an action. God demonstrates his love towards us. And that while, then, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so this leper comes up to Jesus and he says, If you are willing, you can make me whole. He says, you, hey, the man has faith. He says, I know you have the power to heal me. I know that, that you've talked about healing. I know that you've preached on healing. I know that, that, that you can make me whole. There's no doubt in my heart about that. But are you willing? Are you willing to cross a cultural line? Are you willing to take a risk? Are you real, willing to, to touch a leper? Are you willing to, to, to be vulnerable? Are you willing to be exposed to something? Are you willing to take a chance and reach out to somebody that the world says you can't touch, that the world says you can't love, that the world says you can't embrace, that the world says that, 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 that it's unacceptable. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Yeah. I want to say to you, if you are willing, you can change the world. You have the power. Why? Because the love of God lives in you. God lives in you. And the Bible says God is love. And so love has the power to change this world. And if you are willing to share that love, if you are willing to reach out to people that, that are not easy to love, that are unlovable, you can change this world. Amen. You can melt a heart with the love of God that is stony, that is cold, that is hard. The love of God. The Bible says covers a multitude of sins, and we'll talk about that next week. The love of God is powerful. It can change anyone. So are you willing to go beyond words? We'd say it all the time. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you, brother. I love you, sister. But do you really care? We were having that discussion this week among some of our staff. Love is an action. Is it different than caring? No, I think it's the same. That when somebody says, hey, man, I lost my job, I'll be praying for you. Is that just a cliche? Or do you love them enough to really get on your face and cry out to God? Do you love them enough to take them some groceries or to help them find a job? Or, or, or somebody says, oh, my car's broke down. You know, I get calls all the time, all the time. I had one Wednesday. Pastor, I want to come to church on Wednesday. And uh, I, my car, I don't have transportation right now. I live around 14 in Coolidge area. Do you have anybody that can come pick me up? I get those type of calls. We could double the attendance of our church like that if we would really act on this and say, I'm willing to go pick somebody up. I'm willing to care about somebody's spiritual well-being enough to go pick them up and to bring them to church. Amen. That's good preaching, Pastor. Yes, it is. Well, pastor, there's a risk involved. You don't think Jesus took a risk here? You don't think that, that there was a great risk? 
He risked losing his reputation. He risked losing his ministry, his following. You know, take a man that touched a leper. Well, most of his ministry was based on laying his hands on people and healing people. Who would want to be the next person that he prayed for after he touched this leper? You know, come, come lay your hands on me now. That's a great risk. He risked compromising his whole ministry, losing his following by touching this leper. And we're worried about, you know, picking somebody up because of the risk involved. Love takes risk. Reckless love. Reckless love. I'm not talking about putting yourself in danger. I'm not talking about, you know, a death wish or anything like that. But we, I'm talking about getting outside our comfort zone. I'm talking about living what we say and showing we care. When he says, are you willing? To be willing, I looked the word up, it meant to have an inclination, a compulsion, or a desire based on love. To be compelled based on love. That that love of God in your heart becomes so consuming within you that it compels you to want to help people. The Bible says the love of God is in our heart, placed in our heart, shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. In the book of Romans, it says that. And you know, we have great technology here at the church. I, I love the fact that we're able to live stream and YouTube our services and things like that. But what you miss out on when you're watching it is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when you get in the presence of the Holy Spirit, worshiping with the, the, the brothers and sisters that are here, He's imparting the love of God into your heart. And the more that you're in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the more that that love begins to penetrate and saturate and consume your heart, and somebody reaches out to you like this leper did to Jesus, it compels you. It, it, it motivates you. It inspires you. It, it, it's something within you that burdens you, that stirs you to want to, to help this person, to, <clears throat> to touch them because that love of God is, is moving you. He says here he was moved with compassion. And that's what it meant. He was stirred. He was compelled. Why? Because Jesus was full of the presence of God and the Holy Spirit. He could have spoke the word over the leper. There were many different ways that Jesus healed people told a guy, just go wash in, 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 in the, the river and you'll be healed. He didn't have to touch the guy. He could have healed him many different ways. But he made a statement. He said, I'm willing. I'm willing to love you. The man had been rejected. The man had been neglected. The man had, I'm sure, been abused emotionally, maybe even physically, because again, they believe he was cursed by God, so we're going to help God. We're going to get on God's side and beat you up too. They spit on lepers. Jesus was making a statement. I love you. I love you. Come here. Let me touch you. Let me prove my love to you. And I believe this is part about uh, of being a Christian. God demonstrated his love. That we as believers need to demonstrate our love for people. Not just voice it, but reckless love is visual. The word willing is the Greek word thelo, which speaks of what brings us pleasure. And so when Jesus says, I'm willing, he was saying it brings me great pleasure to love you, to touch you, to help you. Hallelujah. And I tell you what brings God pleasure is us emulating these types of things in our life. Secondly, reckless love must be sacrificial. I know there's a, a, a greater number of blanks in your outline this morning. I'm just trying to make sure you're paying attention. So reckless love is visual. Reckless love is sacrificial. In John chapter 15, in verse 12, Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. Then he goes on, he says, greater love has no man than this that he lay his life down for his friends. How did Jesus love us? Sacrificially. Amen. He went to the cross. He took our sin upon him. He died for us. He gave his life for us. This is reckless love. At 33 years of age, he laid down his life in the prime of his life. He says, I came to give my life a ransom for many. 
I came to seek and save that which was lost. I came to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to set the oppressed free. And it required his life to do that. Folks, if we're going to emulate this reckless love to the world, we're going to need to be willing to make some sacrifices. Jesus touching this leprous man risked him being arrested. He was breaking a law. It was a law not to touch lepers. He could have been arrested, infected for this man. In light of the mission of loving people and reaching people, Jesus considered his life insignificant. He put others ahead of himself. He placed the, the life of this man at a higher importance than his own life. And until the church is willing to sacrifice, we will not reach this world because we will not prove to the world that we love them and that we care. We will stop at mere words. And God doesn't want us to stop at words. Oftentimes, Christian people are not willing to sacrifice time, money, convenience, recreation, but yet we want to prove to the world we love you. God loves you. Hallelujah. We're so sanctimonious and phony. I love you, brother. I love you, man. Do you really? Are you willing to sacrifice time, finances, energy, entertainment, recreation, your talents, your convenience, your ability? I mean, we quote this scripture that posted in every sporting event, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he what? Gave. Gave. His only son he sacrificed. That's the measure of love. That's the definition of love. Sacrifice and giving. Not just words. See, that's a problem with our culture and our world. Here in, in, in America, we speak English. And the word love, we have one word. In the Greek culture, they had four or five, maybe even six different words because there were different levels of love. And when I, I look at my wife and I say, I love you, and 30 seconds later, I look at my dog and say, I love you. <laughs> and then I say, hey, can we go to Dairy Queen? I love ice cream. Well, how does that make my wife feel? She's on the same level as my dog and ice cream, right? I mean, surely there's different levels of love, isn't there? The word agape is talking about the love of God. It's the highest level of love. It's, it's sacrificial. It's reckless. It's unconditional. It's unending. It's unselfish. And we need to learn how to get to that level of love. Amen? Amen. Sacrifice, though, isn't easy. In John, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 6, we'll read the 27th, 28th, and then the 31st and 32nd verse, the New Living Translation. It says, But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Boy, this is a tough one, Lord. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you only love those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. Boy, we could chew on that all day, couldn't we? <laughs> Jesus is talking about sacrifice here. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who spitefully use you, it says in one translation, or curse you, it says here. At our food pantry on Monday morning, and I haven't been very often for the last couple years since we moved out to our new house, but there was an individual that would come every Monday that was um, different. It was a man that he liked to wear dresses every Monday. But beyond that, he was just mean, just nasty to everybody, angry all the time. There was just a, a deep-rooted bitterness within him. And it didn't matter what we did to him, he'd just respond with nasty comments. I was... He couldn't say Terry. I was Pastor Cherry. Where's Pastor Cherry at? Okay, I'm right here, man. How you doing today? 
Nobody loves me. That's the way he'd respond. And yet, God kept dealing with my heart every Monday. I've called you to love this guy. I've called you to be nice to this guy. And I tell you what a chore it was. I mean, just because I'd, I'd call him a man. Yes, sir. <laughs> he didn't like that too much because that wasn't how he identified himself as sir. He said, you mean ma'am? I said, yes, sir, I do. <laughs> but I just tried so hard. It was an effort. It was work to smile, to love, to bless him, to help him. And it got, you know, God was dealing with my heart because it started to circulate among our volunteer staff. And nobody wanted to help this person. God's like, here, you got you to gotta lead the way. You got you to gotta love this guy. You got to show them how to love the unlovable, the nasty, the mean, the rotten. And so it, now it, after a while, it became a competition who got to help him because we started to see that hard heart melt just a little bit. Like the Grinch, you know, you saw the movie where his heart just began to change. And it took some time. And I don't know, I probably need to ask Katie if we ever really broke through or continued to have breakthrough in that situation. But there are people like that. And God has called us to love them and to reach them. And you'll find that, like the Grinch, they've got that exterior, that wall, that hardness that they've built up on the outside as a mechanism, a defense mechanism, because they've been neglected, abused like this leper. They've been hurt. They've been despised. And they're afraid to let anybody love them. But on the inside, they're just the same as you and me. They're a child of God, a creation of God. And God gave his life, his son for them. Just like he did you and me. The Bible says God's no respecter of persons. He doesn't see those folks any differently than he sees you and me. He loves us all the same. Amen. 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 People make mistakes. I'll never forget years ago when I was working in youth ministry, there was a young lady that was part of our youth group that her and I just had a great relationship. She was special to me and, and I loved her and I know that she loved me and come to find out one day that she was pregnant not married not really in that close of a relationship with the baby's father and it took her a lot of courage to call me to tell me what had happened and as she shared it with me the spirit of God spoke these words to my heart I said God has never loved you any more than he does right now because it's impossible for him to love you more or less. Amen? That's just the way he is. He loves us the same all the time. It was the love of God that changed lives throughout the Bible. Jesus had compassion. We'd like to thank everybody for checking us out on the website. The Word of God is the power to transform lives, and He's changing lives here at Liberty every day, and we pray that He's changing your lives too. We have a big God and a big vision, and we're bursting with excitement. We pray that you feel the same way wherever you're watching. We understand that you may not always be able to make it to services and experience the great things that God's doing here at Liberty, so we want to be able to continue to grow and expand the ways we bring our ministry to you. The Bible teaches us to bless those who bless us, and if we've blessed you, Please take a minute of your time to let us know what God is doing in your lives, whether it be through email, social media. Please also consider sending an offering or a gift to the website address on your screen. It's a simple process using Easy Tithe. You can give with a credit card, debit card, or bank withdrawal. You can even set up your account to give automatically each week. Technology is a great thing that people can use on the go. We want to continue to be a blessing for you in many ways, but we would need your help. Your offerings and gifts allow us to record and stream our services so that you can watch them online. We want to be able to bring you the highest quality online experience so you can enjoy them without problems or interruptions. Please pray about what you can do to help us today. Thank you again for tuning in. We pray that God will richly bless you and your family. May these teachings radically change your life as they have ours. We pray that God meets all of your needs and that your gifts to this ministry come back to you greater than when you gave them. We love you and hope to hear from you soon. Now we want to return to today's service.
Number three, reckless love is full of compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion. In Psalm 86, verse 15, the psalmist says, You, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Jesus had compassion on the sick, the lost, the oppressed. And this word goes beyond just feeling sorry for somebody or pitying somebody. It's an action word. It says he was moved, moved with compassion. That's a, that's a, a verb. He was stirred emotionally. That something was eating him away at the inside that, that motivated him to act. There was a passion on the inside of him to change lives and to help people. And this is what the love of God is all about. If you don't have this then you need to check your heart. Am I filled with the agape love of God, that high level of love? Because that love should be stirring you on the inside. That love should be moving you to want to do something about a situation. When you see a person, maybe you don't see lepers very often today, but you see somebody with a withered hand or, 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 or a foot that just doesn't, a leg that doesn't work right, or, or somebody that, that's bound with alcoholism or, or, or somebody that's just got that bitter, angry spirit. Instead, of you being indifferent to them instead of you uh, uh, just scorning them and shunning them there should be something stirring you on the inside something moving you on the inside there should be a compassion that is building up inside of you to want to help that person get free to want to reach and touch that person with the love of God the life-changing powerful heavenly love of God hallelujah that's what reckless love is it's full of compassion full of compassion it's the opposite of being a coward. It's the opposite of being afraid. It's the opposite of being indifferent. And let me tell you, this is, this is the strongest spirit that is holding the church back today, is the spirit of indifference. You look at something and you could take it or leave it. You think of church and you could take it or leave it. You think of, uh, uh, of somebody in need and, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know if I got the time for it or not. We've got so many options in the world today. And this is the mentality of the world, and it creeps into the church. Before I make a commitment, before I, I, I do something, before I act on my faith, I want to weigh out all my options and see what else, what, what, what other things, what other options I have. We can't be indifferent to the things of God. We have a commission. We have a commandment. We have a mandate from God. It's not something that we, we can sit at and say, well, you know, let me think about that one. God, no. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. We can't be indifferent to that. Love the world. Reach people with this love of God. It's not something that, that Jesus is, is suggesting to us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. This is the greatest what? Commandment. Not a suggestion. And so because we don't love the Lord our God with all our heart, I'm going to step on some toes right now. But it's obvious we're indifferent to God. When it comes to times of worship or prayer or Bible study, let me see what else I've got going on. That's indifference. That's indifference. You'll never love your neighbor as yourself until you learn how to love the Lord your God with all your heart. John wrote about that in his epistle. He says, if you can't love uh, your neighbor who you see, you'll never love a God that you don't see. We've got to fall in love with Jesus and his presence and his Holy Spirit because he's the one that puts that, that love in our hearts for the world. And these are the, the things that God has said is really the demonstration of our faith, loving God and loving people. That's what it means to be a believer. Hallelujah. Love is not just an attitude. It's not an emotion. It's an action. The Bible says God is love. So when you respond in love, you're responding in God. And there's so many examples throughout the Bible that go beyond this leper or the demoniac that we talked about last week. It was reckless love that shined into a man's life as he was on the road to Damascus. A man that was responsible for persecuting the church. A man that would go into people's homes and drag them out so that they could be arrested and thrown in prison. A man that held the coats of people that were being stoned to death because of their faith in Jesus Christ. A man named Saul. 
that he was on his way to Damascus to pull people out of their homes and, and have them imprisoned for their faith. And the reckless love of God stopped him dead in his tracks and a light so bright, the glory of heaven shined around about him and he was blinded, he could not see. And a voice from heaven said, Saul, Saul, why are you fighting against me? Why are you persecuting me? And Saul gave his life to Jesus that day and became the apostle Paul, the most radical believer I believe that ever lived, the man that wrote two thirds of our New Testament, a man that, that established the Christian church all throughout Europe, a man that was willing to, to, to be killed for his Christian faith. He used to kill people for their Christian faith, but it was the reckless love of God that came down into Paul's life. And that's why Paul said that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. The love of Jesus, this reckless love that when they dragged a woman out into the street and they were ready to stone her, and Jesus was there he said, what's going on? They said, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. I don't know what that looked like, but, but that had to be messy. And Jesus is there and they're looking at him. Ready to stone her. And how he reacted could have cost him his life. He stooped down and began to write things in the ground. Said, you that are without sin, throw the first stone. That was reckless love that laid his life on the line for a woman that was caught in adultery. And they all left one by one and he looked at the woman. He said, where's your accusers? They, they're all gone, Lord. He says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. What do you mean, Lord? She was caught in adultery. That was reckless right there. <laughs> She was caught in adultery, Lord. She's a sinner. She was cheating on her husband. What do you mean you don't condemn her? That's reckless, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, shouldn't we have, have told her what she did wrong and rebuke her for her sin? All he said was, just don't do it again. Go and sin no more. And it was that love that changed that woman's life. He didn't condemn her. He didn't preach at her. He didn't yell at her. He didn't punish her. Yet we, we want to do that in church all the time, don't we? We want to condemn people. We want to tell them how to live their life, what they're doing wrong. We want to tell them to be holy like we are because we're all so good, aren't we? We're all so perfect. Can't help but think of that scripture that says, look, do yourself a favor. Take that telephone pole sticking out of your eye out first before you try to help somebody with a speck sticking out of their eye. I'll talk to legalistic relig religious people sometime that, that, that have that mentality about people's sin and how they need to change and I want to condemn them and judge them. And as I'm talking to them, every once in a while I'll do this. And they'll say, what are you doing? I'm trying to get out of the way of that pole sticking out of your eye. It's about to hit me in the head. Because that's what they're doing. Trying to pick a speck out of somebody else's eye. Jesus said, get, get what's out of your eye first. Out. Judgment begins with us at the house of God. Amen. It was reckless love that prophesied to the promiscuous woman at the well. Reckless love that when a prostitute came in, and began to wash his feet with her tears and dry them with his, her hair. He lifted her up and began to minister to him, her and, and, and Simon. He said, Jesus, what are you doing? And he rebuked Simon, not the woman. And that woman's life was forever changed and she followed Jesus and became a light for him and his cause. It was reckless love that as they were carrying a young boy, out of the city one day who had died in a funeral procession. Just like the lepers, you couldn't touch a dead body because that deadness or disease, that curse would come upon you. The mother was crying. The family was weeping. Jesus walked up and stopped. He was on like a, a cart, like a gurney. Uh, what am I thinking of? Kind of like a something you'd see in the mass show, you know, the... Yeah. Just two poles and a piece of canvas that he was laying on. And he walked up and he stopped the procession and he reached down and touched the boy and brought him back to life. That's reckless love. I tell you, there's times that I'm walking through hospitals 
I just want to walk into a room and begin to pray for somebody. That's reckless love. You see somebody dying or somebody that has died. You want to jump into bed and, and hold them until the life of God comes back in their bodies. We need to get back to that kind of reckless love because love and faith, they go hand in hand. Amen? We read a scripture last week. It says faith works by love. The word work, energized, inner gale, power. It's empowered by love. Our faith is weak, church, because our love is weak. I'll say that again. We don't see signs and wonders and miracles happening in the church because our faith is weak. And our faith is weak because our love is weak. Jesus had so many miracles happening in his life because of the compassion that stirred him and motivated him and moved him. Finally, this morning, number four, reckless love must be sincere. And I've intentionally talked about different things that this generation is looking for. They're looking for things that are visual. They're looking for things that are sacrificial. They're looking for genuineness, for sincerity, for things that are real. You know, there was a movement many years ago towards this seeker-sensitive church. And a lot of the generation before this flocked to that because it was comfortable, it was easy. But a lot of people are beginning to leave those big mega churches because there's a lack of sincerity. There's a lack of the authentic Christianity that you read about in the Bible. There's a lack of substance. They want something that's real. They want something that, that, that's genuine. First John chapter 4, John wrote these words, verses 17 and 18. He said, Love has been perfected among us that we might have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who, has, who fears has not been made perfect in love. Perfect love is that agape I was talking about earlier today. The word perfect speaks of maturity, completeness. But it also speaks about the end result. It speaks of eternity. It speaks about our, our vision, what we're headed for, what our goals are. Perfect love is a love that's motivated by eternity. It's a, it's a love that has its sights set on eternity. It's a love that's demonstrated by a mature believer. It's the highest, most sincere kind of love. It's a love that doesn't make excuses. Amen. And I see that among a lot of believers today. We've got all kinds of reasons why we can't do what God is telling us to do here. And you know what they all are? They're just excuses. They're just excuses. One of my favorite quotes of all time I heard from a man named Ed Cole many years ago. He said this, he says, when you begin to justify is when you need to start to crucify. And you know, we justify a lot of things because we've got excuses, we've got reasons. And that's just an indication that there's something you need to crucify in your life. Something that's keeping you from doing what God's called you to do. Jesus could have had many excuses not to touch this leper. But yet he did it anyway because he saw the eternal consequence of this man in the balance. Perfect love looks at eternity. And it does things that impact or affect eternity. And not only the eternity of the person that we're touching, but we talked about it last week, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Our love reaching out, taking this, this reckless approach affects our eternity too. It affects the reward that God gives us for eternity. When you're willing to take a chance, you'll hear those words someday, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord because you had the courage to be reckless with the love of God and to reach out to people. Many people are afraid to be reckless for God. They'll serve Him but they've got conditions. They've got boundaries. They'll only go so far. Reckless love goes beyond the boundaries. That's one of the definitions of reckless. No boundaries, no conditions. God's love is unconditional. And perfect love is not afraid to share Jesus. Amen? Amen. Finally, and I've already touched on this in the conclusion, reckless love values eternity. There's some 
words in this last scripture that we read in 1 John about eternity and about judgment. We just got done talking uh, about the book of Revelation, so these things are fresh in our mind. But in James, the second chapter, the 13th verse, it says, Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, one of the things I shared as we were doing our series on Revelation is that we as believers will be judged based on our, our works, our actions here on the earth. More precisely, I believe we're going to be judged on what we did with the love that God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. What did you do with it? Do you know that God has placed that, that love in your heart not just for your benefit, but to give it away? You know, Jesus, the Bible says that he didn't consider his position with God something to be grasped, but came to this earth and gave his life for us. What does that mean? It means that what God gave him, Jesus didn't hold on to for his own personal benefit, but he gave it away to other people. And so God gives us his love. Oh, he's lavished his love upon us. He's poured his love upon us. And it's not for us just to go, oh, God, thank you. Don't we have a great relationship? I love you. You love me. Oh, it's so wonderful. No, he's given us this love for us to give it away. For us to, to extend it to other people and to touch the lives of other people with this great love that God has put in our heart. So that when we stand before God in the day of judgment, Mercy will triumph over judgment. The mercy that we have shown other people will cause us to have a victorious judgment. Are you with me this morning? But you could also look at it this way. If you want to have a great experience on the judgment day, when you see somebody else, don't judge them. Be merciful to them. Why? Because mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy is always the better approach. What is mercy? Mercy is, is one of the definitions for compassion. If you, you, you look it up, and I was studying it this week, love, compassion, mercy, they're all synonyms. They all go together because mercy is acting on that love. Compassion is, is, is the motivation to be merciful, to act out, and to do what God's called us to do. People who walk in love will not fear the judgment. That's what these two passages are, are about that we just read. It says there in 1 John 4, it says, uh, when love is perfected among us, we'll have boldness in the day of judgment. We'll have confidence. If you live this love lifestyle, you're not going to fear being judged by God. You're not going to scramble at the last minute and go, oh my gosh, Jesus is coming. I've got to get things in order. Oh, forgive me. I said that to you last week. You know, I've been treating you like a, like a, a, a jerk my whole life. I'm sorry. God's coming back. I've got to get this right. No, that's a person that, that's not looking forward to the judgment, that's worried about the judgment, concerned about the judgment. But if we are learn how to perfect love, when we stand before God, we're, we're not going to be afraid. There's some folks, Christian folks I know, that are afraid to die. And that's tough. That's a tough place to be. But if we learn to walk in love, we will not fear death. It says fear involves torment. Why? Because fear is the opposite of love. We shared that last week. The people that are afraid, they don't reach out to help people. If Jesus lived in fear, he would have never touched this leper or the demoniac or the woman caught in adultery, or the woman at the well. But when you love people, you're not afraid. But when you're afraid, you judge people. I've watched so many people over the years with unforgiveness and unresolved conflicts and bitterness. And it says here that fear involves torment. And I've watched people that, again, they have these unresolved conflicts and unforgiveness and bitterness, and they're tormented. Not just in this life, I believe in eternity. It will affect your eternity. So let's love people. Amen? Amen? You know, love is a decision. It's a decision. And so I want to challenge you this morning to decide to love. Is there anybody here this morning say, I want to decide to love? I'm going to choose to love people. Amen? Because love 
triumphs over judgment. It's always the best approach. Let's bow our heads this morning. If you're here today and you've never become a child of God, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to try to draw you in through some, some type of hype or manipulation or anything like that. I, I just want you to know that if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior and, and in your heart, while your head's bowed, you're, you're searching your heart this morning, you're not sure where you're at with God. That would cause me concern about my eternity or my judgment. I was in that place one day many years ago. My pastor stood up in front of me, my youth pastor, as he was given an invitation just like I am right now. And he, he said, if you're here today and if you were to die after this service, God forbid, do you, do you know where you'd spend eternity? And I wasn't sure. I didn't know. I, I didn't know I was right with God. I was afraid to die. I was afraid to face God. He said, if you're not sure or you're afraid to face God or you're not ready, lift up your hand. I want to pray for you. And I tell you, I was at that place, as many of you might be this morning. And I want to ask you that same question. Are you ready to be judged by God? Are you ready to face eternity? You know, we want to always use certain vernacular and speak certain words. Are you saved? Are you born again? Are you? I just put it real plain and simple for you. If you were to die right now and stand before God and give an account for your life and be judged by Him, are you ready? Christian, non-Christian, saved, not saved. I'll throw all that out right now. Are you afraid to stand before God? That's what we're talking about. Something in your heart's not right. You're not living in love, but you're living in fear. Fear is the opposite of love. And I want to do for you what my youth pastor did for me that day. He invited the presence of God to fill my heart. And the love of God came into my life that day in, in an incredible way. I'm not perfect. I, I, I still have my struggles in attitudes and with people. I don't handle every situation right. But the closer I get to God and the more my heart is filled with Him, the more I feel something stirring in me to love people, everybody, unconditionally. If you're here today and you want to get your heart right with God, well, heads are bowed. People are praying. Just lift your hand up. You can put it right back down. I'm going to lift my hand. God, it's me. I, 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 I'm, it's not that I'm not afraid to, to meet you, Lord God, but there's things I still want to get right in my life, Lord. And I need your help to perfect this love in my life. If you raised your hand or you didn't raise your hand, maybe you're a coward or a chicken like I am sometimes you still have an opportunity to pray with us because we're all going to say this together. Say this with me. Say, God, I need you. There are things in my heart that you're dealing with this morning and I want to make them right. I want to love you and I want to love people. I make a decision, a choice today to walk in love. But in order to do that, I need to get close to you because that love comes from you. I ask you today, Lord, to fill my heart with your presence. But I also commit my life, my time, my energy, my strength to serving you in a deeper way. God, I want to sacrifice God, I want to commit to you. God, I want to be compassionate. I want to be real. But I also want to demonstrate your love. So I ask you today, God, to fill me with your reckless love and to forgive me and to cleanse me from everything that keeps me from serving you with all of my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I love you guys. And I am determined to not stop at mere words. Amen. Oh, the